I recently attended the 2014 Cold Fusion IAP course at MIT in Cambridge, Mass., put together by Dr. Peter Hagelstein and Dr. Mitchell Schwartz. Complete films of those lectures, as well as last year's lectures from January 2013, are available on coldfusionnow.org and on Cold Fusion Now's YouTube channel. Those lectures are a wellspring of pertinent information on cold fusion science, and I highly recommend those of you interested in learning more about the technology of cold fusion go and review those lectures. Dr. Mitchell Schwartz says he originally got into cold fusion research at MIT in order to debunk it. Now, after years of research, he is teaching a course at MIT on cold fusion experiments, methods, and results, and works alongside Dr. Hagelstein, who is the theoretical side of the team. Now, for those of you who don't know, cold fusion is based on the idea that if you load enough hydrogen or deuterium atoms inside a metal lattice, like nickel or palladium, they become so tightly packed together that they begin to actually fuse. Two world-renowned electrochemists, Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischmann, were the first to claim the discovery of excess heat effects in cold fusion. Some of their colleagues thought that, since the discovery was so important, it might be a good idea to go public with an announcement through the media. That turned out to be a very bad idea. The media turned against Pons and Fleischmann and started a witch hunt within the scientific community. Pons and Fleischmann were quickly debunked, and the entire concept of cold fusion was labeled a fiasco, and even a hoax. Two primary studies in particular were successful in shifting mainstream scientific opinion against cold fusion forever. These two studies are also cited by the patent offices for refusing any and all patents on cold fusion related devices. Those are the MIT and Caltech studies commissioned by the DOE. But according to a different team of MIT scientists who worked on the problem of cold fusion for a much longer period of time and did much more careful and focused work on the cold fusion problem, they now claim that those original MIT and Caltech studies which failed to replicate cold fusion did so because they did not achieve high enough states of loading in their experiments. That is, they did not pack enough deuterium molecules inside their cathodes to reach the required reaction range. This is very important. Experiment trumps theory and science, and there are many scientists from all over the world risking their careers and reputations to claim positive results in cold fusion experiments. But when those early MIT and Caltech replications failed to reproduce the effect, those experiments were cited as complete proof that no such effect indeed existed. At MIT last week, this team of scientists carefully laid out the facts regarding cold fusion and explained that according to their experiments, you don't ever see excess heat until you get over 90% D to PD loading ratio. It maxes out around 95% loading, and Caltech and MIT never got above 80%. So this is why their experiments failed to produce any excess heat. If this is true, then these are possibly the most epic scientific failures in modern technological history. Caltech scientists like Nathan Lewis, who when told their loading was not high enough by other scientists in the field, even had the nerve to reply, The loading is plenty high. There is no effect. And while critics and skeptics like to call cold fusion pathological science, in light of recent events, it seems that their denial is the only thing that is pathological. Well, if there really is an effect, as more and more evidence seems to be piling up that cold fusion effects are real, that would mean that these scientists who ridiculed and mocked cold fusion back in the 80s and 90s and even today can be blamed for setting all of our technology back 20 plus years. Just imagine that today we might have hoverboards, flying cars, and a booming space tourism business had history gone a bit differently. And don't laugh, there was a guy from Terrafugia at the IAP course last week at MIT, and he is serious about using cold fusion power to build flying cars. This is serious business. While others are dreaming up ideas on what to do with cold fusion once we get the science nailed down, Dr. Hagelstein and Dr. Schwartz are busy nailing down that science. They have begun to compile a list of conditions which enhance the production of excess heat in cold fusion experiments, and also a list of things that will kill the reaction or cause it to stop producing excess heat. For example, applying an external magnetic field and shining an infrared laser on the cathodes have been shown to enhance the production of excess heat while things like cracking or brittleness caused by defects in the metal or by loading too quickly cause the deuterium to leak out and not maintain sufficient loading, thus killing the reaction. 
They have also determined that the reactions are occurring at the surface of the materials, possibly through an effect of the surface plasmons. So to maximize the effect, you need to maximize surface area. But as you do that, you also produce a lot of helium-4 fusion product, which needs to be dissipated from the system. So what they have done is to use deuterated palladium nanomaterial, suspended like chocolate chips inside a cookie dough of zirconium oxide. This is the basic design behind Mitchell Schwartz's Nanor technology, which uses nanomaterials to maximize cold fusion reaction rates and efficiency. His best nanors put out 14 times excess power, which is a very huge deal. And though the nanors may not look all too impressive, basically they just look like a copper wire, this is quite possibly the beginning of the largest technological breakthrough that our generation will witness. In the future, you will be able to fill your car's gas tank with one gallon of water and drive 55,000 miles. The cold fusion revolution will render coal, gas, and nuclear fuels obsolete, completely decimating a multi-billion dollar industry and freeing humanity from the economic restraints of rising energy costs and meter-based centralized distribution systems. The future these corporate energy megagiants fear most will be one built on decentralized, off-the-grid home power and heating systems based on cold fusion water-powered technologies. No wonder there is so much top-level resistance to this idea. Cold fusion is real. This group at MIT claims to have nailed down most of the science behind how to get it working reliably and consistently, and it's about to make a comeback and completely change everything, if it weren't for all the unfounded doubts about its validity. The original MIT and Caltech studies failed to reproduce the cold fusion excess heat phenomenon because they did not achieve high enough loading in their cathodes. That claim alone should make the entire scientific community question these studies and want to go back and redo those experiments with better quality palladium and achieve 95% loading. There is a reason they call it research in science, because you find out what changed, what factors are the key essential elements to getting something to work, and then you research by doing experiments. You don't just do one or two experiments and then give up on the most promising energy source ever to be allegedly discovered in the history of science and technology. Look at how much we continue to spend on the search for dark matter, and we still haven't found any dark matter. And dark matter doesn't even have any practical real-world applications. Hmm, so if your theory predicts something that there is absolutely zero experimental evidence for, you spend hundreds of millions to search for it, but when an experiment or a series of experiments, like Pons and Fleischmann et al., find experimental evidence for something that disagrees with your textbook theories, the scientific community starts a witch hunt to shun the evidence, discredit the experimentalists, and blacklist the topic from all serious scientific discussion. Why is that? How could that be? Well, it might have something to do with the fact that cold fusion directly threatens all the biggest, most profitable, and political institutions on the entire planet, namely the oil companies and the big banks. Which, in case you haven't been paying attention the past hundred years or so, pretty much run the show, but I'm not going to get too deep into that here. I encourage anyone who's interested in learning more about the science of cold fusion and where the field is currently at today in 2014 to go and watch those lectures I posted on coldfusionnow.org. There are five lectures total, which are three hours long each, and plenty of reference papers on the slides to look up and keep you busy for a while. These lectures are an amazing resource for information. If you'd like to help me cover more events like this in the future, donations are always welcome through my website. Parking tickets, gas, and food all cost money, as does the time it takes to film and edit 15 plus hours of video. Thanks to those of you who have donated already. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. Check out some of my other videos. Thanks a lot. I can see it happening in my lifetime's closer than you think.